stuff so easy. Okay, then I'm going to Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I've just been told, of course, I have to take my mask off in case anyone is lip reading, at least for those of you who watch later overseas. That is the practice in Australia that news readers and outside reporters take off their masks when they're talking to the camera. And I'm trying to look at the camera now and not look ahead to the two people who are here in the congregation with me. Um, as everyone in Australia knows, our lockdown six is continuing and lockdowns across the country are increasing. So it's, yeah, we're not quite sure whether we'll be meeting like this next week, only like this, we'll certainly still be streaming, or whether we'll actually be meeting in person here but we trust that you and your loved ones are well and that you will find the service today helpful. That's us now, just past 11, so I'll move away and let Graham take over. Well, thank you, Christine. And Welcome to our service this morning. We trust that uh, this slightly shorter than usual time uh, for a gathered service, given that there will be no uh, opportunity to sing, we hope that it still will be helpful to you and uh, uh, encouraging to you as your, in your life as a Christian person. And we're so pleased you've joined us online. It's quite a challenge as this uh, lockdown uh, number six, as Christine says, continues. We started streaming services on the 22nd of March last year, and we never imagined we'd still be streaming services in August, a year later. I'm going to uh, invite you to join with me in prayer as we commit our time to God. Let us pray. God, we come to you as our Heavenly Father. We thank you for the opportunity of connecting uh, using the internet and using the recording technology that's available to us these days. And we pray that uh, you'll give us a sense of uh, each other's presence and, uh, and especially of your presence, that, that we won't just be uh, speaking to the air, but that we'll be hearing your voice from the scriptures and we'll be drawn nearer to Jesus and to the things that he said matter most. So we ask that you'll take each of the elements of this stream service and bless them to everyone who views and joins us online. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christine's going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Well, in the two weeks when we were in Bondi in the last school holidays, we had a feast of Disney movies, two of which I'll mention today. This past week, we purchased from Kurong a book which I meant to have to show you, but you'll see it shortly. Um, it's by Rebecca McLaughlin. She's an academic and a Christian apologist whom we respect and whose writings we enjoy. She's very readable. Her book, Confronting Christianity, last year was named Beautiful Orthodoxy Book of the Year 
by Christianity Today. Her most recent book, and the one I'm going to be reading extracts from, is 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask and Answer About Christianity. I think you can see that reasonably well. I hope to finish it before lockdown six ends, and I hope I don't have too long to finish it. I've also ordered a copy for our oldest grandson and his wife. I want them to read it and advise me as to whether they think it's suitable for our teenage grandchildren, so their younger cousins. I recommend that parents either read it with their children or maybe read it themselves first or just be able to discuss it with them. As I said, her works are very readable. So now I'm going to read some extracts from the first chapter, which I've actually um, typed up instead of reading straight from the book. At the beginning of the film Moana, one of the ones we saw in Bondi, everyone is happy on the island except Moana. Even though she is the daughter of the chief, Moana doesn't quite belong. She longs for adventure, so she looks out to sea and sings about how she's been staring at the edge of the water all her life. She tries to forget adventure and fit in, but it doesn't work. The voice inside her sings a different song. Perhaps you feel a bit the same, like you don't belong here. Perhaps when you read stories like Harry Potter or see films like Moam Anna, you find yourself staring at the edge of the water, wishing those magical worlds were real. That's how I felt when I first read Lord of the Rings. The older I get, the more I am sure that the real world is even more magical than those imaginary ones. It's one of the reasons I believe in Jesus. The voice inside me sings a different song. Following Jesus does not mean ignoring what I see around me. Just as Moana's dream of sailing out to sea doesn't mean abandoning her life, but saving it. So, and I'm reading from Rebecca, from her book, I want to suggest that following Jesus doesn't only give us a way to live our best life forever after we die, it also in some unexpected ways means living our best life together now. Rebecca goes on to give seven pieces of evidence to show how following Jesus gives us our best life now. Being an academic herself, she bases much of this on academic research and her references are all there in the book. So I think there are seven points altogether. People who go to church regularly are healthier and happier and much less likely to get involved in unhealthy lifestyles. She quotes at length from a Harvard professor, Tyler Vanderweel, whom she says calls the world expert on this topic. I will leave you to read for yourself selves the rest of what she says on this topic. The next one she mentions is that love is the most important thing. Here she refers to another film we watched, Frozen. I'm sure many of you have seen it probably many times. I think there's probably several editions now. All of you who've watched it will know the story. Elsa's parents respond to her dangerous ice powers by cutting her off from her sister Anna. In the end, Elsa discovers that love of friends and family is vital to our happiness. And here, Rebecca McLaughlin refers to a 25-year-long 
Harvard study on well-being. Younger people in the study tended to expect that their happiness will depend on fame, wealth and success, but they were wrong. Good relationships with family and friends were caught were what kept people happy and healthy. For Christians, love is the heart of everything, or should be if we are really following Christ in our heart of hearts. In the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 8, we read, God is love. In, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus says to his followers, Love one another as I have loved you. Now the other points Rebecca makes are helping others is good for us, gratitude is good for us, forgiveness is good for you, meaning not just the person forgiven, but the person doing the forgiving. Grit, meaning perseverance, is good for you. And finally, the love of money lets us down. So I'll leave you to find out more about what she says in those sections. And now I'm going to read the last paragraph of this first chapter. Staring at the edge of the water, Moana wondered if there were any adventures before her and asked how far she'd go. So far in my life, I found that following Jesus is the surest path to love joy and adventure. I still feel as if I don't belong at times, but that's something Jesus followers should expect. Like Harry Potter growing up in the muggle world, we also don't really belong here. We belong to Jesus' much more magical world, and that world is just starting to break in. May God bless us all. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. The Council at Jerusalem. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way. And as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling them about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. 
Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Amen. Thank you, Amanda, for reading to us that uh, key passage from the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the notes for today's sermon are in the leaflet, which is not yet on the web page, but I'm, I'll send it to Ken shortly so that it will be uploaded. So if you want to follow uh, the sermon uh, with some downloaded notes, you'll be able to get that. But I want to... to uh, look in particular at this council that met in Jerusalem. What were, they, what were they doing and why, and why would it be of interest to us? Um, so I've used this uh, image, which is the cover of a book, actually, on the first council of Jerusalem. It's a, a council which is recognized by Christians uh, all around the world as having great significance and uh, should guide all of us, the Jerusalem council. I want to deal with three aspects of it. Uh, first of all, I want to think about who's who in Jerusalem, why are they there? Then we want to think about the issue. Is it just tradition versus innovation? What's, what uh, uh, is it sort of uh, something that we often see today where conservative forces say one thing and sort of innovative and experimental ideas are on the other hand? Is that what it is or is it something more? And then thirdly, I want to notice uh, three things, two of which are guiding principles that I think come out of the letter, which was uh, summarizing the results of their conference. So let's think, first of all, about who's who in Jerusalem and why are they there? Well, I, I looked again at the, the, the journey from uh, Jer Antioch to Jerusalem uh, on uh, Google Maps. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to my great astonishment when I looked at it, it said it was something like a four-hour flight. And I thought, oh, it can't possibly be that, that far. It's, it's actually a 134-hour walk if you use the walking track that comes along the high country down the backbone of Israel and Jordan. Uh, today, it would be a very difficult journey to do because of the boundaries, because of the shortage of fuel, because of the terrible situation in, in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, but in Paul's day, of course, this was uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, and they stuck to the coast. Uh, and presumably it, it took about a week. Why were, the, why were Paul and Barnabas doing this journey? Well, the answer was that up in Antioch, there had been some dissension. That after Paul and Barnabas had gone off on their missionary exploration, which we thought about a week or two ago, uh, when they came back, they stayed a long time, but there were reasons for that. They, Peter had been there, and Peter had come, and, and he had uh, had fellowship with the new Christians, but then some of the, <clears throat> the uh, Pharisaic or the circumcision party, as it's described, came along and said, no, no, you shouldn't be eating with, uh, with Gentiles. I mean, they're, they're getting their meat from the pagan temples. They're eating, uh, they're eating blood. Uh, they're doing all sorts of things that you as a Jew shouldn't do. And Peter withdrew from them. And how do we know this? Well, in that long time that Paul and Barnabas stayed in, in uh, Antioch, uh, we understand that the letter to the Galatians was written. And you'll find that information in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 2. So in chapter 2, 
Peter t- is rebuked by, by the Apostle Paul and says he, he was, had to be corrected on this, which is a pretty strong confrontation. Uh, and you can, and as, you, as you read about it, you realize that this, uh, this uh, letter uh, had a huge impact, uh, as we shall see. And then, of course, Peter uh, is back in Jerusalem when Paul and Barnabas go down there. And the idea is to take this matter to the leaders of the church, to the apostles in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what we're told they do. Uh, the, uh, the ones in Antioch who had started the disruption, uh, saying that you cannot be, uh, be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. And Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument about this. So it, it was a, a strong contention. And uh, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas should go to Jerusalem. Of course, there they would meet with Peter again. And as you, as, as uh, Amanda read the passage, uh, you probably caught on to the idea that uh, there was a, a measure of attentiveness. Uh, how, what should be done when there's a strong disagreement? Well, um, we shouldn't just turn our backs and not be talking to the other party. We should be engaging in careful listening and, and careful thinking. And this is what was uh, the, the goal in Jerusalem, was to think about this. And so uh, James was there in Jerusalem as well. Now this James, we believe, was James the brother of Jesus. All right. So remember, early on, uh, the brothers of Jesus and his sisters thought he was mad at one point. You know, uh, so they weren't following him from the beginning. But after Pentecost, uh, they came into the church and uh, James became the leader of the Jerusalem church after the death uh, of, of several of the other key players. And so James is there. And later on, we read that uh, Bar Sabbas, who had the first name of or another name, uh, Judas, Judas Barsabbas, to distinguish him, 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 of course, from the Judas who betrayed Jesus. Uh, this Judas and Silas, a new name that's going to come up again later in the Acts of the Apostles. These two are delegated as the authorized uh, bearers of the letter. In those days, they didn't have passwords like we do, so you, you didn't have to log on and type in a password or a, a, a PIN number. Uh, So how did you know if a letter was genuine? The answer was, who brought it to you? All right. Uh, So uh, we know that uh, in the the centuries which followed, there were a number of uh, letters which were written, which uh, were given the names of the apostles, but had no connection at all to the apostles. I won't bother mentioning any, but if you've read anything of Dan Brown and the uh, Da Vinci Code, you'll know he likes to play around with those other later documents and suggest that they were, in fact, the earlier ones. So so who's who in Jerusalem? Well, Paul and Barnabas have to sort this issue out, and they're gathering with the apostles. Now, the problem, what is the problem in Jerusalem? Is it just traditionalists resisting change? Or is the situation more complex than that? Because it seems like we've got the law, the circumcision party, uh, those who are are in favor of the Levitical uh, dietary laws, uh, and they're resisting Peter's vision. Isn't it extraordinary thing? It was Peter who had the vision and who saw in Cornelius and his household uh, the marks that had marked out the, the early believers in Jerusalem And he baptized them because of the faith that they professed. And we see all nations starting to be gathered. But hey, maybe it wasn't a big enough flood. Maybe it was just a a trickle. But Peter had this vision. And remember, it was repeated. It's recorded in in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Peter had already been carried forward to see that the Gentiles, that all nations, were to be included. He'd be reminded of this. The idea, of course, goes back to the very beginning uh, of the uh, book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, when God takes Abraham and brings him out of uh, Iraq, as it is today, to a land of promise. It says, through you, and I will bless all the nations of the earth. And so 
at the back of Judaism is this big idea, and it surfaces again and again in the Old Testament writings, that uh, God didn't choose Israel because they were big and powerful, but he chose them because they were nothing, they were nobody. But he was going to make somebody of them and bring, bring his blessing to all the nations through them. A great promise. And it turned out uh, not like uh, so many of the Jews believed, but uh, to the, the devout and the pious ones that are mentioned, for example, in our Christmas stories, the beginning of Luke's Gospel, uh, we, we have those who are open to God changing and doing something wonderful. So how could this dispute make progress? We've got this, what seems like, uh, division between uh, tradition and innovation. But it's more than this. And this is what we need to look at. We need to look a little bit more closely. It seems like tradition versus innovation, but in fact, it's not that. It's not just blind tradition, and it's not just innovation. Actually, what we're seeing is something totally different. The question is, what is the gospel? What is the good news for the world? And the answer one party was given was, well, it's about Jesus, but you need to be, uh, if you, you need to be circumcised, you need to be... Uh, you need to adhere to the Jewish food laws and, and uh, you need to remember the Sabbath and there's a whole string of things that had to be done as well. So in a sense, the gospel wasn't about good news, it was about good advice. Get Jesus in your life and get this and get that and get the other thing. And, and all of these things will make you acceptable to God. But actually, the, the contrast is that the gospel is good news. It's about what God has done for you and how he sees you in Christ. And you're his. And you're his beloved child. And that's all the difference. It's about what God has done for us. The gospel is good news. It's not for nothing that the, uh, the Bible translation uh, was given in the 1960s to the uh, the. The then translation was the Good News Bible. It's picking up on this idea that the gospel is not good advice. It's good news. So here is the, the change. They've, the work is finished. Christ said on the cross, it is finished. He has done what is necessary. The cross is the central theme that goes on from there. Paul mentions it again uh, to the, to the uh, Corinthians. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ my Lord. And in, in Galatians, uh, sorry, in, in, in Colossians, he tells us that what circumcision represented has been replaced by baptism. And, and he says, in him you were baptized. You were, circum when you, were, you were circumcised when you were baptized, which really is a change of heart. That change of heart that opens you to Jesus. So the points of view have been shared and what do they do? Well, they come to a, a conclusion about what should be done. I just think James's words here are so wise. Uh, first of all, there's no need for circumcision. They're not going to impose this on the Gentiles. They can see that what circumcision represented, being in God's covenant, has already happened with the, with the Gentiles. They've been brought into the covenant people of God through Christ. So there's no need for circumcision and there's going to be uh, danger here of giving offence. What's going to happen? Because all around the Mediterranean there were synagogues and people in the synagogues were starting to believe in Jesus. Had they to forsake their Judaism? Uh, or, uh, was that no longer, was that out? No. What about the Gentiles who were coming in or the ones who were, were interested in the uh, in the Jewish God, the one God of Israel, the God-fearers who had attached themselves to the synagogue. Need they be circumcised? Need they switch their diets completely? What was to happen here? And the answer seemed to be, there's no need for circumcision, but there's no needless offence. We don't want to give any offence. And of course, you know, in a world where the day-to-day -day life was... Uh, uh, associated with uh, eating meat that had been offered in pagan temples, uh, dietary things that were offensive to Jewish people, uh, and, and, and behaviours which were 
out of ex a totally unacceptable, uh, they mention, look, we don't want offence to be caused by this range of things. And so they mentioned the things which came in at, at the, the end of the letter. We, we didn't actually read those things, but let me read them to you now. It says, uh, the Holy Spirit and we have agreed to put in Put, not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that, that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. So here are some guidelines. And if the uh, Gentile believers uh, conform in this way, they won't offend the Jewish believers. And so together they will commend the message of Jesus. So here is the... the uh, circumstance. Later on, uh, well not later on, it seems that Paul had already written to the Galatians and in this letter that he had written in uh, around the year between 48 and 50, we can't be certain, uh, he says this in chapter 3, in Christ's family there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us you are all equal. That is, we are all in com a common relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship is our faith in him. We trust him. We trust that he has given himself for us. And that by that act, the gospel is, has opened up to the whole world. That if we trust him, we are included in God's love and favor and our sins have been forgiven. And we have forsaken the idols that were part of our lives, perhaps the money that we pursued. Christine mentioned how love of money lets you down, book for teenagers, but some of us take a lot longer to realize that. So here, here it is. Uh, the the uh, relationship with God is established through Jesus Christ our Lord. At, uh, at the end last week, uh, I put up a quotation from Greg Sheridan. Let me remind it, you of it. He said in his latest book, instead of mounting a military or political challenge, Paul revolutionized the inner identity of pagan society. He tore its mind out. In his lucid, penetrating, unprecedented writings, he left a, bl a blueprint of how it was done. He tore its mind out. The mind that said that there were hierarchy, that the emperor was divine, that there was society was had a hierarchical structure. We can see it in the writings of uh, Yuval Harari, an Israeli uh, atheist uh, philosopher and, uh, and writer today, who, who says that in the future we're mo moving back to the areas when there will be uh, super people and there will be disposable sapiens. Uh, it's awful to contemplate some of the dystopian scenarios he envisages where the, the ultra-rich uh, create communities of their own and leave outside those who are virtually expendable. It, it's uh, so, so far a cry from what the New Testament puts before us, which is that we need to change our mind. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind. He tore their mind out. And so Gentile people started to repent and say, yes, I need forgiveness. And the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, his message has come to flower, to fulfillment. And so the old ways that prepared for this moment are, are fast falling away and, and the, uh, the Gentiles are being grafted in, as Paul is later to write in the letter to the Romans. So John Stott says, in commenting on this, they had to... Uh, save the gospel from corruption by saying no to circumcision. But they had to produce harmony and save the gospel from, save the churches from dissension and division. And they gave advice about that. No needless offense. And the third thing was that message had to be communicated back to the church at Antioch. And so uh, Barsabbas and Silas were commissioned to do that, to take that message. And we have uh, the vestige of the letter here in the, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. I commend it to you. It follows on from where Amanda finished reading. And so let us uh, 
think about these things as we uh, teach and learn the truth together and as we seek to give no offense to those whose lives are different as we share with them the good news that God is love and his love is redeeming love. Now I'm going to invite Amanda to play for us. Uh, she'll introduce the piece. Thank you, Amanda. I'm going to play uh, Saraband <coughs> from Bach's uh, Suite for Solo Cello in G major. His first suite. G major is a key full of hope, I think. Thank you, Amanda. Full of hope indeed. Shall we now join our hearts in prayer? Let us pray together. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that the renewal of creation and the blessing of humanity was your pledged intention. It is awesome that the blessing to the nations today is the outcome of your covenant with Abraham. We thank you that the hope never died. We thank you that we who are so distant in time, geography and culture are nevertheless beneficiaries of your grace through faith in Jesus, your beloved son. In him we find acceptance and come now as your children in prayer. As we bow before you, we recognize that we are unworthy of your mercy. Our egotism and greed cry out against us. We have done those things we ought not to have done, and the things that we ought to have done, we have left undone. Forgive us. In the face of our guilt, you sent your beloved Son to atone for all our unrighteousness. And so guilt is gone, your joy has been bequeathed to us, 
looking upon us now, you are the first to see our best and not our worst. You are working your will on earth as in heaven. Perhaps we've known of Jesus all our lives and experienced his love communicated in our family or church circles since infancy. Perhaps he's come to us as a joyful discovery relieving a recent crisis. We give thanks for those who share the message of Jesus with us. Help us as a church to keep the redeeming love of Jesus central, recognizing that we can add nothing to his salvation, neither can anyone take us from his care. We pray for Christian brothers and sisters seeking to worship you in difficult and dangerous places. Today we pray for all countries ravaged by war and injustice, especially for Afghanistan, where people had begun to enjoy improved standards of health and education. We are horrified as we watch all this being swept away by the return of the Taliban. Please comfort those who now fear their loved ones gave their lives in vain. Please prosper efforts to evacuate those who worked with Western allies and those whose lives are now at risk. Today we pray for the churches in Australia that as in the Jerusalem Council, so in committees and assemblies, may your church promote honest and helpful debate. May the Holy Spirit cause us to work together for the cause of your kingdom with all who call Jesus. Lord. We ask for the state and federal leaders to manage the public health issues created by COVID so that lives are saved and livelihoods protected. Help each of us to play our part in halting the virus and supporting one another to promote good health in the community. We're conscious that there are surging cases of infection in other countries. Thank you that vaccines got through to East Timor this week. We remember elderly, vulnerable and sick friends this morning who along with parents of school children will face difficulty in the extension of the lockdown. Please bring encouragement, healing and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. Lord, help them to cast all their care on you and to know you care for them. We ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray and say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love, and with all the church of God. Amen. <coughs>